Bow hunting backyard bucks. When the whitetail's expanding range met with land developers from the city, the ever adaptable whitetail moved into the city limits. Today, exceptionally antlered whitetail bucks are thriving right in our backyards, near new subdivisions, behind shopping malls and in the shadow of high-rise apartments. As communities grow, fringe areas with low deer densities are created on the edge of the whitetail's expanding range. Such low numbers allow deer within the fringe to be more secretive. As a result, fringe bucks generally live longer and therefore develop into greater trophies. These backyard bucks, living within earshot of humans, have become largely nocturnal and therefore are especially difficult to harvest. Yet, year after year, these overlooked hotspots are continuing to produce trophy class bucks. Whether you bow hunt the Midwest, the East, or South of the Mason-Dixon line, it's time you turned your attention to backyard bucks. Hi, I'm Bob Kirshner, and I'm here with two of my bow hunting friends, Gary Eckert and Dan Brothers. Are you satisfied with your bow hunting success? Are you confident in the locations that you hunt? You are going to be surprised in the areas that we key in on for hunting exceptional antlered whitetails. Bow hunting is a never-ending learning experience. Most hunters already do the big things right, but it's paying attention to the details, the finer points. These factors will make you a more successful bow hunter. Gun hunting is, and always will be, a very effective way to harvest whitetail deer, especially on your terms. But that's usually at long range. To be a successful bow hunter, you need to change your thinking and put on the mind of a predator, like an owl, for instance, swooping down on its prey. Let us teach you how you can be a more effective bow hunter. A lot of this information has been gained by personal experience, things that work well for us. Take advantage of these methods, and you will find that some of your best bow hunting is right in your own backyard.
This select team of bow hunting experts will bring you to full draw on backyard bucks. Bow hunting host Bob Kirshner is a recognized authority on bow hunting urban whitetails. Bob is also a leading outdoor writer, photographer, and member of the prestigious Pope and Young Club. His research on deer lure since 1973 has led him to the how-to forefront of lure and scent hunting technology. Each year, Kirshner lectures to thousands of bow hunters. It pays to listen to a man who has taken 35 trophy whitetails with a bow, including seven Pope and Young bucks. A bow hunter's most effective edge is know-how. Dan Brothers is the master of bow hunting savvy. Dan's hands-on experience with backyard bucks, both north and south of the Mason-Dixon line, will help you become a more successful bow hunter. Gary Eckert is best known as an outdoor writer and monthly columnist for Pennsylvania Sportsman magazine. His extensive bow hunting background will offer insight into the lives of backyard bucks in eastern suburbs. Gary has taken 30 Pennsylvania bucks with his bow. As a University of West Virginia professor of wildlife management, Dr. Dave Samuel offers specific insight into urban whitetail behavior. He is the lead conservation editor for Bowhunter magazine and serves as president of the National Bowhunter Education Foundation. This avid bowhunter is one of America's most respected whitetail writers. Deer herds are exploding all over, the, uh, all over their range and especially in the eastern United States. And wildlife biologists really don't know what's causing this. Uh, one major theory is that the deer level of deer is at a, a certain point, increasing slightly. But when it reaches a, a, a particular point on the graph where all the does are being bred by bucks, the population just shoots up. Regardless of what causes the population to shoot up, it's happening right now in the eastern United States, and bow hunters are the beneficiaries. With this increasing deer population all over the east, urban deer populations are also going to increase. The reason that occurs is quite simple. Your deer herds increase in a rural environment. This forces deer to move into new areas. Some of that will be in urban situations. The urban situation is great for deer. It has all, all, everything they need. It has good cover, good food, some security. Makes it really good for the bow hunter, too, because uh, gun hunters can't be hunting in that urban situation, and bow hunters can. Backyard bucks, the bucks that live in uh, urban environments, are very adaptable. And uh, they're different than uh, our rural mountain bucks, uh, and, and, and does are, too. Uh, for example, uh, they react to humans quite differently. They are around human scent all the time, urban bucks. They're around uh, human environments all the time. They're used to noises that uh, other deer are not used to. They're used to the noise of children playing in the backyard in the sandbox and dogs barking and, and doors slamming and uh, cars screeching and uh, all those types of urban environmental sounds. And they don't overreact to those sounds. They take it all in stride and adapt to it. If we put all those same noises out into a rural environment, we'd drive the deer crazy for a while. They, they would adapt too eventually, but uh, there is definitely a difference. You may think that a buck like this could only survive four or five years of hunting pressure if he lived on a large tract of posted land in prime farm country. But that's not so. No more than 100 yards from where I'm standing, I harvested that particular exceptional antlered whitetail in this small 15-acre woodlot. Over here, we have a major highway. During the rush hour, it's bumper to bumper with traffic. Here, we have a housing development, which must house over 500 people. Over here, we have an industrial park. It employs over 1,500 people. Exceptional antlered whitetails can and do thrive in urban backyards. During his preseason scouting, Bob found a bargain where most hunters never bother looking, behind the local Kmart. Most bow hunters never consider hunting near major shopping centers. One reason such areas consistently produce trophy whitetails is their proximity to sparsely populated areas. Although at first this may not seem to be true, when you think about it, most human activity near a shopping center occurs within the parking lot. 
leaving a broad region around the shopping center, which is often undeveloped, free of human approach. And this is the very type habitat big bucks seek for safety. Urban bow hunting calls for special considerations while around others. Don't parade about wearing camo headnets or face paint or carrying bows and broadheads in plain sight. Note how Bob carries his hunting clothes in his pack while keeping his bow cased, waiting until he's in the woods to change into his hunting clothing. Being discreet serves two ends. First, you don't alert other hunters to your hot spots. Secondly, you won't offend non-hunters whom you might encounter on the way to the woods.
What a great, exceptional antlered buck. About a 20 inch spread on this guy, and look at it, he's nine points. You got three acorn points. Acorn points, that's when they damage their points when they're in velvet and they re-adhere themselves. This is a great buck, and he's gonna be amongst some of the best trophies that I have ever harvested. I got this guy here within three, 400 yards of a local shopping center. During these crazy days, there's a lot of confusion in the woods. It's the bucks looking for the does. It's when the does are chasing away the fawns. The bucks are making scrapes, rubbing trees, laying out territories. A lot of confusion, and he's making mistakes. These backyard bucks, that's about the only time that I found that you can harvest these guys. It's when they're loaded with testosterone before they breed a few does and they make mistakes. This particular animal here, I got him at 2.30 in the afternoon. Did you notice how he sniffed those weeds as he circled that apple tree? I put out some curiosity lure in key locations this morning before I got into my stand. He must have stopped 10 times. Bucks really respond to lure during the pre-rut crazy days. The very first time that you hunt a particular tree stand location is when you're going to have the greatest chance in harvesting a particular exceptional antlered buck. So I highly recommend getting in that location undetected, get in before daylight hours and spend as much time as you can in that particular stand. Believe me, your time will be well spent. Bow hunters can use the phase of the moon to give them advantage in any hunting situation. When you have a full moon, old wives' tales said that deer were only active at night. That proves not to be true. Deer are more active not only at night, but in the daytime when there's a full moon. In fact, five-year-old bucks have been shown to be very active in the evening from 3 to 7 p.m. during the full moon. When there's a quarter of a moon or less, Large bucks have been to be shown to be most active in the morning from 6 to 9 a.m. Full moon, active in the evening, quarter moon or less, active in the morning. Wind affects deer movement as well, and it affects how bucks will move. The wind, in general, the more wind you have, the less deer will move. So best time to hunt is when you have no wind or wind less than five miles per hour. However, on very windy days with gusts up to 20 miles per hour, recent studies have shown that deer become extremely active, even more so than when there is no wind at all. And the biologists that have done these studies really can't explain why this is happening. One theory is that the deer are just more nervous when it's extremely windy and thus move around more. So don't give up on very windy days. And in fact, on very windy days, try to be in your tree stand. It's a good chance to run into a big buck. Twenty yards, broadside, and wide open. That's the shot we're always after. That's the shot that we practice. But there's more to it than that, because the reality of it all is the deer may be closer. He may be ten yards. He may be five yards especially if it follows your trail to your tree. Be able to know that you can handle that shot and not have to wait till it gets farther out and broadside and wide open. Know the anatomy of the deer so when he's broadside or slightly angling away, you know the pathway of the arrow where it's gonna hit the vitals. 
Practice that. Practice standing up in your stand slowly, moving left, moving right. And when you take those short shots, spin at the waist, or you'll shoot over the deer. And when you shoot at the deer, aim at the shoulder. No. Aim behind the shoulder. No, it's more than that. Aim at a spot. No, aim at a hair. <laughs> I can't overemphasize that. You gotta aim at a precise point. It's like, well, you'll hit center, you'll hit closer to the center of a golf ball than you will shoot to the center of a basketball. So if you concentrate on the fine point, you'll be more accurate. And when you do, make sure there's a quality, very sharp broadhead on the end of it. Because sharpness is everything. Because it leads to quick recoveries, good blood trails, and you owe it to the deer. You owe it to the bow hunt itself to make quick, humane kills. So keep those things sharp and practice that. Practice at unknown yardages, know the anatomy, and also shoot under low light conditions like we have now, because that's when most of your shots are gonna come. Is there seclusion for deer within the city limits? You bet there is. And the whitetails are already living there. To access these areas, you have to push yourself to cross obstacles and barriers that often discourage the casual walker. You've got to be willing to go the distance to locate the biggest bucks. You might have to cross a stream or climb a few hundred yards up a steep hillside. Just like bucks elsewhere in the whitetail range, backyard bucks seek out the most secure area they can. And that's where you'll have to go to find them. <laughs> you ever had buck fever? Isn't that a scary thing? Kind of like the first time you kissed a girl, isn't it? <laughs> Get all excited, your head's kind of clogged up, you're nervous, jittery, heart seems to be up in your throat. <sighs> I tell you, when it comes with the bow hunting, that's the, probably the major cause for shirt tails being cut off. <laughs> but I tell you, I hope I don't ever lose it because that's a major part of bow hunting, close contact with game and being excited. It's the thrill of it. But I tell you, there's something you can do to help overcome it, and that's practice. Practice on small game, those yearlings, something you're not intending on shooting. Learn to stand up in that stand quietly, smoothly, draw back on your game, aim, count to three, and then let down. That builds confidence. Confidence is what you need for that. When that big buck comes out there, you practice that, and you'll be better at it. You'll be better at those precise shots. I'll tell you something else. It's going to save a lot of wear and tear on your clothes, too. <laughs> When scouting and hunting backyard bucks, don't confuse city limits with whitetail limits. As urban areas continue to expand with the construction of new schools and subdivisions, the backyard buck adjusts further to man's presence. Surprisingly, the largest number of Pope and Young whitetail bucks harvested in the entire state of Pennsylvania have come from the counties with the highest human populations, near the cities of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. Bow hunters who hunt in urban situations have certain responsibilities. They have to take special care when they're bow hunting. Here's some of the things they might think about doing when they're out in the woods. One concern are the non-hunting public that they would run into when they're hunting in urban situations. A lot of the uh, non-hunters will not understand what we're doing and why we're out there. So uh, remaining inconspicuous can be important. It isn't that we're trying to hide from anything. It's just that we don't want to cause undue concern among non-hunting public. When hunting backyard bucks, it's important to make our entry into a hunting area without drawing attention to ourselves as hunters. As a public resource, we need to remember that a white-tailed deer belongs to everyone until we harvest him. Then, and only then, does he become ours. Therefore, when successful in a backyard hunt, it is of paramount importance to remove our game only when other people won't be encountered. Another reason big bucks manage to do well near urban areas is in their ability to coexist with man at close quarters. While it is true that a trophy buck will avoid people at all costs, once he becomes educated to the habits of man, he can live virtually under the nose of most hunters with little fear of detection.
wasn't he? Too close. Why are you too close for me? I like him about 30 yards, 20, 30 yards. <laughs> That's close. Whew. You shouldn't go too far. You shouldn't go far at all. Oh, man, I finally got you, buddy. <laughs> I finally got you. He is no monster, but I was after this buck because the last three or four times I was in here, I saw this buck at a distance, and you can tell him from all the other ones that I saw in here because look how white his horns are. I don't know what makes him that way, but <laughs> I know this is the first opportunity he gave me to get a shot, and oh, it just got on me. It was too close. It's a good thing I practiced that shot from tree stands at home because, man, that was... You know, I practiced my 20-yard, my 30-yard shots, but underneath my stand, that was one thing I neglected to practice until just the other day. I thought, you never know. Be prepared. But when I did, I put the pin on that deer, and I said, no, that's too close. It ain't going to work. Shoot instinctive. And I almost shot instinctive, and then I said, no, wait a minute. Trust your pin. It'll work. So I took a moment, calmed down for just a second, enough to hold that pin and let it go. And that's right where it went. I was so glad that I saw that arrow go in him. And I'm glad he ran off for a short distance. He probably ran, I don't know, 60, 75 yards, something like that. This is a trophy to me because this is the one I've been after. Not just another deer, but this deer. Because I saw those white horns and I said, I want that one. He's not a monster, but he makes me tickle. This particular buck lived within a quarter of a mile of a subdivision in an elementary school over here. I could hear him playing on the playground, and I know this buck could hear him also. But it didn't bother him. He's lived his whole life in this area hearing these noises. I tell you, some of the benefits of hunting backyard bucks are that when all the other guys are going off to camps, eating cold beans out of a can, you can stay close to home, have a good hot meal, make your wife a whole lot happier, and she's going to let you hunt more often. So get out there and hunt some backyard bucks. Bow hunting ethics is a personal thing. It's really the basis for all bow hunting, and it's the basis for the future of bow hunting. When you're on that mountaintop and it's 10 minutes before shooting time and a deer walks by, you have to personally decide whether you want to shoot the deer or not. The legalities that really don't enter into it because nobody will be there to arrest you and nobody will know. But it really says a lot about the future of bow hunting if too many bow hunters decide that they should take that shot. For the future of bow hunting, we really have to maintain and practice our own good personal bow hunting ethical standards. Don't confuse hunting success with a dead deer. We've become overly conscious of harvesting animals. And I think that's an, a mistake. There's a whole lot more to bow hunting than killing deer. Being out in the woods, uh, being out with our relatives, our sons, our fathers, seeing deer, seeing game, appreciating nature, that's what bow hunting is all about. If you can harvest a deer, fine. But if you don't harvest one, you have still had a very successful hunt and a good time. That's what bow hunting is all about. That's where the future lies, that's where the tradition lies, and that's the part that we have to keep alive. Have you ever had a string peep turn on you in the morning hours or evening hours when you're taking a shot at a good buck? Frustrating, isn't it? Here's a little tip that I use. I place a few strands of dental floss around my string, and when I pull it up to my face, this is a reference point similar to a string peep. Tree stand hunters, have you ever had an arrow fall off of your rest, hit the base of your tree? Here's a neat little device that prevents that from happening. 
It's called an arrow holder. This little device holds your arrow on your rest, and when you pull it back, it releases very silently. This little device is something that I always use. Have you ever drawn your arrow past your arrow rest and your plunger button and heard that little squeaking noise? This is caused by dust particles building up on your arrow shafts. Now here's a little tip will prevent your deer from hearing that when he's in close for a perfect shot. Just rub your finger across the side of your nose and put a little bit of those oils on your plunger button and your arrow rest. Try that little tip. When you pull that arrow back, that deer will not hear that arrow passing over that rest, and you'll get yourself a perfect shot instead of a shot of the deer running in the opposite direction. Like similar unexpected backyard hotspots, urban golf courses represent prime areas where you can find terrific whitetail hunting. They offer a natural edge area for the fickle backyard buck. One clear dividend of the golf course is the abundance of high quality grasses serving as a constant food item. Additionally, the terrain bordering many courses provides a haven of natural cover, often matched with mast producing trees, such as white and red oak. Add to this the variety of terrain surrounding many courses, along with an ample water supply, and the diligent bow hunter can easily recognize the golf course as a place to break par on an urban buck. When hunting near such urban areas as schoolyards, factories, or golf courses, you can only afford to take a shot which results in a quick, clean kill. On this hunt, Bob was looking for a standing broadside shot. Anything less should always be avoided, especially when hunting the backyard buck. The damage which bow hunters would suffer from a wounded or dying deer crossing a playground or country club cannot be measured. For this reason, Bob was forced to pass up what was an iffy shot at a true trophy whitetail. When you're hunting in areas where there may be other hunters or even especially in urban areas where there may be kids that wander through the woods, the best idea I found for being safe is to take your steps out. Take your steps out like the sky hooks. They come out easily. Take out five or six. That way you don't have to worry about any accidents while you're going away from your tree. I'll tell you something else. When you're coming down at night, and it seems like your feet are groping for the steps, paint the tops of them white. It'll help you find them a whole lot easier, and you'll feel safer when you come down. Many bow hunters today associate white-tailed deer with the wilderness. In reality, deer can make any place home. To the bow hunter, this means being able to recognize habitat and focus on small areas, such as the woodlot between where I'm standing and the high school. I know I find excellent hunting around rural communities, and here's why. The quality of the deer are there due to the fact that hunting pressure has been shifting to the cities and away from rural areas. Expanding communities are encroaching on deer habitat and farmland, but don't be concerned about that. The animals are adjusting quite nicely. Food sources like fruit trees are abundant around farmland. If you're hunting bucks close to home, you can be sure of one thing, they're definitely no pushover. In virtually every community, there are apple trees. While it's common knowledge that deer eat over 100 types of foods that range from nuts to berries to fruit to browse, apples are certainly one of their favorite. I have a number of choice locations, stands that I've used over the years, that are located nearby apple trees. Real producers when the apples are falling to the ground and deer are in the area. Not every apple tree in a woodlot is a producer of fruit. Normally when a tree does not produce, it's because it's in a deteriorated state such as the one behind me here. If you want to increase your odds on bagging a whitetail near an apple tree, there are some things that you can do.
As any apple grower or owner of an apple orchard could tell you, apple trees need a lot of tender, loving care. Pruning is, is one way to improve the bearing of fruit on an apple tree year after year. Another thing you may want to consider is clearing the area around an apple tree and not just the sucker limbs off the apple tree itself. And you do this by removing the trees that shade the apple tree. Of course, you never want to cut any trees without getting the landowner's permission. The little time you spend in February pruning those apple trees and taking care of them are going to make them real deer producers come October.
It's a year and a half old backyard buck, fat and healthy. Probably lived his whole life less than 200 yards from that home and that highway. He's had it for my freezer. Harvested this buck less than five minutes from my home. 18,000 people live less than two miles away. I was given that opportunity this year by scouting before and after work, a luxury that you can enjoy when you hunt close to home. Looking back, I attribute my success this year to what I was doing last February, pruning that apple tree. The tree had a good crop this year. There were a lot of deer using the area. I'd seen other bucks in that area when I was pre-season scouting. When I climbed that pine tree this evening, the hunt was 80% over. The other 20% happened tonight when my buck walked under me and I tipped him over. This is a real good time to be talking about uh, whitetails keying on certain food sources here this fall because we have a tremendous acorn production in the northeastern United States and, and uh, deer, of course, love acorns. But and we tend to think about whitetails having a tough time getting through the winter and we worry about what they're going to eat in the winter time. But the most critical time for whitetails relative to nutrition and getting through the winter is the fall right now. Uh, and when you have a, a year like we're having now where there's tremendous amounts of acorns in these woodlots, uh, the bow hunter first off has a nice place to bow hunt because he can get into those acorns and, and actually bow hunt for the deer. And the deer have a really nice place to be to get tons of fat built up on them to get them through the winter. And this means that next spring we're going to have uh, does with more uh, twins. We're going to have does with healthier fawns. We're going to have bucks starting their antler production a little earlier and, and have bigger antlers. Everything related to what bow hunters want from deer, more deer and bigger deer, is tied to a good fall production of food such as acorns. Other overlooked areas for urban white-tailed bucks are the wooded edges surrounding many industrial complexes. In nearly every community where one finds intensive industry, bow hunters have an abundance of prime white-tail habitat in which to hunt. Like newer schools and subdivisions, industry is often situated on the perimeter of population centers. On these large tracts of land adjacent to industry, good bow hunting can be found in unlimited variety.
no more than 500 yards from here, I'm looking at a parking lot. And in this parking lot, there must be an estimate of 200 cars parked there. I'm sure a lot of these people working at this factory are bow hunters. This buck here came from behind this manufacturing facility. I scouted the area that this buck had come from on a sunny day. The leaves were crisp, and I heard a lot of squirrels in the area. When I approached where the squirrels were, I found that there was a lot of oaks, heavy with acorns. I knew that this was going to be a good location. Chances are, within a mile or two of where you work, you're going to find a good buck like this one here. Take advantage of these locations. Get out there and hunt before work and maybe after work. It doesn't take much time to harvest a big buck such as this one when you scout him out before the season and understand his movement. One tip relative to scouting for deer that I use, and a lot of people use, is to get out after the rifle season and scout for big bucks. If that buck made it through the rifle season, then you know he's probably going to be around next fall. And now's the time to find that buck. And one way to do it is to get out there and look for his scrapes. He will still be initiating breeding scrapes sometimes through January and into February. And if you can find that scrape, he may well be right there next fall when you have your bow in your hand. Scouting plays a very important role in bow hunting success. I spend at least twice as much time scouting as I actually do bow hunting. I do a lot of my scouting after the regular gun season, right around Super Bowl time. Instead of watching football games, about 10 o'clock in the morning, I get out scouting for whitetails for the next bow season. Some of the things that I look for during this time of the year are beds of deer. Deer rubs against trees. These are survivors. This tells you what's going to be in there when bow season rolls around. I try to find the thickest part of the area that the territory provides. These thickets are where the bucks spend most of their time during daylight hours during the bow season. During this time of the year, you have no natural obstacles. You have no leaves on the trees. You can see real well. No insect problems. And you have a blackboard on the ground. The snow tells you what kind of deer is in the area. You look for beds of deer. Look for deer tracks. Look for these rubs. All these things are keys that are going to make your bow hunts more successful when bow season rolls around. Once you find a good deer trail in your urban area, backtrack it and it'll lead you into the thicket where most of the deer do their winter browsing. These thickets are key location for bow hunting success. When you approach the thicket, look and see if you chase the deer out of his bed. Try circling this thicket and see if there's deer trails or the deer running out of the location. What's this telling you? This is telling you that your approach has been detected. The next time you come into that bedding location, Come in from another angle, maybe 180 degrees or 90 degrees to the way you approached it the previous day, and check the results. Try to get as close as you can without being detected. These bedding locations and urban areas are key locations for bow hunting success. I've taken as high as five bucks in five consecutive years out of one bedding location. Keep these areas top secret. When scouting a thicket, look for deer beds. Deer beds offer a lot of good information about the deer in your location. Look and see how the deer's bed is positioned in the snow. It tells you the predominant wind direction. Note the tracks leading in toward the beds. Look for antler marks in the snow. Look for urine marks. All these things offer good information. Let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. Let's say that this is a deer's bed. This is the rump of the animal. This is the head. The wind is blowing in this direction. When you approach this area, you come in 90 degrees to the wind direction. It tells you the predominant wind direction by looking at a bed. Also, look for antler marks in the snow when he lays his head down. It tells you if it's a buck or a doe. Antler marks would be in this location or over here where he tucks his nose under his front legs. Another thing to look for is yarn marks. First thing you do when you get up in the morning is go to the bathroom. Same with the deer. If the deer isn't chased out of his bed, look for urine marks. 
A round circular yarn mark in this location indicates a doe. A straight line of yarn with drops as he comes out of the bed is a good indication that it's a buck. Note the tracks leading in and out of a bed. It tells you the size of the deer that used that bed. If you find a track that's small, good indication that it's a small deer. But if you find a large track, a track that's three inches in diameter, the size of a coffee cup, it's a good indication that it's a buck, but not a guarantee. See if the animal walked with a gant. Now, by gant, I mean his front feet are spread outward. As bucks get older, they get more and more knock knee, similar to that of horses. Get out there after the regular gun season, when there's snow on the ground, do some winter scouting. Winter scouting pays big dividends. To be a serious bow hunter, your number one goal has to be scent control. With a little precaution with baking soda, scent-free soap, and even the neutralizers that are on the market, you can keep your body and your clothes, and especially your boots, more scent-free than they are right now. And that'll help you in the warfare you wage against the white-tailed deer, against their nose. They depend on that nose of theirs more than they do their eyes or their ears. All throughout their life, every breath they take is scanned and filter for the approach of danger. Even while asleep, they can smell with their noses, even in total darkness. They can see with their noses over a ridge, down in a gully, through the thickest brush. They live by their nose and they trust that. And if they smell you, it's over with. So what you need to do is to take precaution. Make a little effort. And when you do, make sure you know which way the wind's going. You got to know where it's going. Wind's got to be your friend. If wind's not going to be your friend, it'll clearly be your enemy. What I mean by that is you got to keep it in your face. It's just like people. <laughs> your friends are in your face, right? Your enemies are always at your back. Well, that's how it's got to be. And keep that in mind. Always keep track of the wind and where it's going. A few things that I do to keep track of the wind direction are a cigarette lighter. You use that and it always shows you the direction of the wind with a flame. Or you can use some scentless powder. And I know you're gonna say, oh, they can smell that. If they can smell that, they're gonna smell you. Don't be afraid of trying it. But what I depend on the most is a white thread on my stabilizer. That tells me all the time where the wind's going, where my scent's going. And if it tears off, just unwind some more. Just wind a lot of it on your stabilizer. Just let out six, eight inches, and it'll tell you all the time where your scent's going. You need to be aware of that. Take precautions, and you'll be a better bull hunter and more successful, and it'll help you win in the warfare with white-tailed deer. Many bow hunters, including myself, has had problems shooting over the back of a buck when you're hunting in a portable tree stand. And it's probably due to the acute angle now here's a little tip that I've found that'll prevent this from happening. One of the things that I use is a kiss button on the string. And I also position my nose on the string when I pull it back. If you think about the sight triangle, it's where you anchor your bow, the distance from the anchor point to your eye and your front pin. If that changes, then you're gonna shoot high or low. You wanna keep that as consistent as possible. Watch me illustrate how this can be done. Now, can you imagine if you didn't have a good anchor point, what would happen in the back? Here's another illustration when you anchor to the corner of your mouth and note the difference in the sight triangle. When you shoot down, that sight triangle would get smaller. It's important that you keep your sight triangle consistent. That's why I use a kiss button and position the string with my nose. If you plan on hunting full-size deer, you should practice on a full-size deer target. Know your effective range. Having complete confidence in your ability to tip over a buck within your effective shooting range is more than half the battle.
I think I really found a good spot here. Yesterday afternoon, we placed this trail timer up here, and we're going to examine it and see exactly what time this animal had tripped it. It reads 6.32 p.m., which is perfect because it's well within the shooting hours. On the way in today, I had noticed that there were several deer beds off here to the right. This is great because it's probably beds that they're using after they take care of their feeding out here in the bean field. The beans are all clipped off at the top. We have the water hole behind us. We have the beans out in front of us, the beds, plus in addition to all that, here out in front is a persimmon tree. And these whitetails, they just love ripe persimmons when they fall on the ground. This is an island within a bean field that a lot of hunters would overlook. Let's take a look back at what had happened here. We found a good spot. We did a little bit of pre-season scouting. We located a good area. We placed our tree stand in a great spot. We have the beans and everything else here that is going to make those deer come to this one particular area. We all know that success is where opportunity meets preparation. But what had happened? I missed. Pure excitement had caused me to miss. That's what bow hunting's all about. Come right underneath us. Oh, man. Yeah. 
It only could happen to somebody like me. Oh, well. You're going to have to sharpen your arrows because you shot all of them in the dirt. Like yeah. Big boys there. He sure got away, too, did he? <laughs> In every city where the whitetail is found, you will also find a landscape laced with rivers, creeks, brooks, and small streams. These waterways feature plenty of thickets and other cover along their banks, regardless of their size. As elsewhere, such thick cover provides the perfect security for an urban trophy. Several features account for this superb big buck habitat. In most cases, such river bottoms are swampy lowlands subject to regular flooding during heavy rain. This makes them unsuitable for development by man. Yet, this same flooding offers great advantage for the whitetail. It brings the full complement of trace elements and nutrients to the soil, promoting exceptional antler growth for the backyard buck. At the same time, it ensures a healthy return of undergrowth for the security-conscious whitetail. Some prime locations are very difficult to get to, such as mine where I have to go through a tunnel underneath an interstate. The things I go through to get a big buck. Since 1973, Bob has operated a scent and lure company. His most recent development is a rut lure, designed to attract dominant bucks. Here, Bob is making a mock scrape and applying silver top buck lure to the scrape.
Man. Take a look at this six point, ain't he something? It's gotta be about 22 inch spread on this buck. Unbelievable, it's one of the biggest six points I've ever shot. You know, a friend of mine told me about this buck, but I never seen him in this area. I scouted him out, searched him out in his bottom. He was bedding down in his bottom lands. And on top of this little bit of a ridge up here, a little plateau, I knew I'd have a chance at him up there because the wind was right. I made a mimic type scrape up there, used a little silver top, brought him right in for a perfect shot. I think the lure brought the other bucks in too. This had to be one of the best tree stand locations I've ever picked. Certain circumstances allowed me to harvest this exceptional antlered buck. First of all, I did some scouting for him. I learned where his bedding locations were. He was bedding in the bottom lands. Also, I found his track. There was a lot of rub trees and it kind of indicated to me where he was spending a lot of time. I made a mimic type mock scrape on a little plateau on an area where the wind currents was perfect. I couldn't pick up my scent from an elevated position. I believe this is the largest buck in the area. This is an exceptional antler buck, even though it isn't a trophy type class animal, record book type animal. You know, that's really what a true trophy is. If you get the biggest buck the area provides, that's a true trophy. I believe this animal has exceptional antlers because he's somewhat mature. The excess amount of calcium, phosphorus, and protein went into his antler growth. He lived primarily in the bottom lands, and these areas were rich in these minerals. That's why he produced such a large set of antlers for this area. Let's review the shot. The buck was coming toward me directly toward the scrape. He stuck his nose down into the scrape, but the angle was wrong. He probably was expecting me to shoot at that time, but I waited. I held back and waited to the correct quartering away position presented itself. When I released the arrow, you've probably seen it angle forward in through his vital area. This is important for quick recovery of your animal. Bow hunting in urban situations is going to increase because the deer herds are increasing and using the bow many times is the only way to harvest those large numbers of deer that occur there. This causes some concern to residents, uh, non-hunters, and one way to, to quell the concern and, and eliminate any cause, uh, anything that might be upsetting to the non-hunter is a bow hunter education. And we have in the United States a, a bow hunter education program that's outstanding. It's administered by the National Bow Hunter Education Foundation. It's a 10 hour course that works beautifully to uh, eliminate any problems you might have when you're bow hunting in an urban environment. It should not be that killing is the point of bow hunting. Rather, to bow hunt is to bring yourself to a state of keen precision. It is where you become part of your weapon. It is where you achieve a level of alertness within your bow hunting environment. It is where you attain a degree of mental efficiency that will allow for a clean delivery should the opportunity arise. Beyond this, bow hunting evolves into a personal quest, a quest for that which is most elusive. Isn't this great how this works? I want to wish you the best of luck with your bow hunting and also to keep an eye out for me because you'll never know when I may show up in your backyard. <laughs>